God is very similar in a way. It's the ultimate pattern. It's the ultimate agent. Uh, it causes everything, determines everything, explains everything uh, from monothe polytheistic gods to the monotheistic god. It doesn't matter. They're all just versions of intentional agents that are invisible and hidden out there. Now later I'll come back to talking about government and politics a little bit, but in this context, uh, something, uh, something major, a huge shift happened between three and 5,000 years ago. When uh, there, were, there were really no belief in gods or there was nothing like religion, like we think of these concepts, in, in hunter-gatherer communities. They, they had very different versions of religion and gods and, uh, than ours. But nevertheless, um, most moral conflicts and behavioral problems and conflicts that people have with one another these were resolved in these small communities because everybody uh, is either related to one another or knows one another. So the, beha the evolutionary logic behind cooperation and prosociality and altruism and being nice to your fellow kin and kind makes all kinds of sense from a pure selfish gene model. There's all kinds of good reasons how we can construct a moral basis to life with people we're related to or know one another intimately and we spend our entire lives with. If, there's too, if you do too much free riding and cheating the system and, and screwing people and not being honest and so on, here's how hunter-gatherers solve this problem. They take you out on a hike or a walk and, and they come back and you're not there anymore. <laughs> All right, that's how they deal, deal with it. And so, um, but the free rider problem always exists a little bit, right? So, and that can be dealt with informally by shunning by gossiping, talking about who has a good reputation and not. So it behooves you to, to not just pretend to be a good group member, but to actually be a good group member, to believe it, to be a moral person, that, to be a good friend, a reliable friend. You actually do care about the other person. That's as good as friendship and morality gets. Uh, and it makes evolutionary sense. The problem is, is once these small bands and tribes began to coalesce into chiefdoms and states three to 5,000 years ago, and populations exploded into thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and even millions. Uh, the free rider problem e escalates and there's too much opportunity for anonymous free riding and cheating the system. And so, to, for those informal means to keep it in check. So you need uh, a set of rules and everybody gets a copy. And, and that's what government does, right? So government arose as a sort of a behavioral check, like we need some means here of resolving conflict. Everybody gets a copy of the rules and here's a list of the punishments you get if you violate the rules, okay? And by the way, if you think you got away with it because nobody saw, there's an invisible man in the sky <laughs> and he sees everything. <laughs> and you'll get your comeuppance in the next life. So if you think you got away with it now, you didn't, right? So religion and government. Government for the here and now, religion for the hereafter. All scores will be settled. Justice will be served. We, have, we definitely have a, a justice neural network or a justice module in our brain. We are finely tuned to sensing when uh, things are not fair. When somebody got one crumb more of the cake than I got, I, I can really see, I can tell the difference, right? So we're good at that. We want... We have a sense we want justice to be served. Hitler did not get away with it, damn it. Okay, so that, I mean, this is the kind of arguments you hear, right? But there's a good reason for that, an evolutionary reason. We, uh, we have a strong sense of, uh, uh, of puni what's called moral punishment or, or moral moralistic punishment or, or revenge or uh, the sense that justice is served and it actually, there's brain scan research on this and neurochemical research on this. It feels good to see somebody get it who really deserved it. Like in movies. Movies, uh, you know, ply in this sort of thing. I, I witnessed this personally watching uh, the girl with the, the dragon tattoo, right? So it has this gratuitously uh, uh, erotic or violent rape scene. And uh, I just remember thinking, wow, this is really uh, over the top. And then I saw why they made it over the top, because the revenge scene where she gets, she gets him back is just so enjoyable. It's like, <laughs> stick it to this guy. I mean, she zaps him with a taser and down he goes. Boom, he, she bolts him to the floor and rips him to shreds and tattoos his torso and his forehead. It was just great. I mean, it's just like the old Bronson movies, you know, in the Bronx where, you know, Bronson had social justice. He's going to 
The police won't do it, I'm doing it, right? This feels good, okay? So we have all that already hardwired in. So one of the, comp one of the comp sort of compelling arguments for God is that it explains everything and, and justice will be served. This is all going to be uh, meted out in the end, right? So on, on top of that, then there's a lot of good arguments that I present on behavioral genetics. About 50% of the variance in religious beliefs is, is genetic. We know this from extensive twin studies. Not just religious attitudes, but political attitudes. So I'll come back to that. Just remember that. Pretty much half of everything we are is genetic. But not, don't, don't get depressed about that. That leaves half for you, <laughs> for the environment. <laughs> My favorite t-shirt that I've yet to make is uh, nature versus nurture. And then on the back it says, either way it's your parents' fault. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> you're not responsible. <laughs> I know, you're a parent, I'm a parent. It's all right. <laughs> we did it to them. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then finally, um, I do have a discussion on um, refuting the God argument simply because that, that's what people are really interested in. Yeah, but there really is a God. I know all that other stuff, but there really is a God, right? Uh, well, okay, so the, the standard atheist line is, I can't prove a negative, I can't prove there is no God. Actually, we can do better than that. I, I show how we can make positive arguments in favor of the sociology, psychology, and anthropology of humans constructing God beliefs, constructing God concepts. And you can just do this by comparative mythology, all that Joseph Campbell stuff, comparative world religions. There's a huge body of literature on this. Where you happen to be born is the number one predictor of what your religion is. You just stop and think about that for a second. And just lay that on somebody sometime. You do realize that had you not been born in Alabama, had you been born in India, you wouldn't be an evangelical born again. You realize that, right? I mean, unless you happen to be the child of missionaries who were in India, who came from America, but that's not what we're talking about here. So that, or had you been born 5,000 years ago, you know, you, just make it 2,500 years ago, you'd believe in all those Roman gods. You, you wouldn't be a Christian because there was no Christ. <laughs> there was no Messiah. I know, Christ is not Jesus' last name. <laughs> I know. But it comes off the tongue, so he, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, and so, right, right there. And then, then there's all the anthropology of beliefs. You can clearly see that every group in the world believes some kind of agent, hidden, invisible agent. They call it different things. We're all atheists of those gods, and as the trope now goes, some of us just go one god further. And, and those are good arguments to make. And most people grasp that once you say it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the vast sea of the human imagination, that has created thousands of gods, what are the chances that you got the right one and everybody else is wrong? I mean, maybe, so you can kind of present it like this. Yeah, you might be right. I mean, it's possible you're the one that got it right and the hundred billion people that came before you are all wrong. It's possible, but really, I mean, really? You really think that? Now, some people actually do go, yeah, actually I do. <laughs> I actually think I'm right. It's like, okay, well. <laughs> Not much more to say after that. Uh, but that, but that, so we can actually make a positive uh, case for arguments against God because humans construct God beliefs. Uh, and then finally, I, I, I end that chapter by talking about that I don't think it's even possible to have any kind of scientific test that would ever prove God, God's existence, because the concept itself is, uh, doesn't really make sense in a scientific worldview. Because God ultimately has to be a supernatural being. And a supernatural being who is outside of space and time is by definition unmeasurable, undetectable. And so what's the difference between an invisible God and a non-existent God? There's no difference. So at some point, every Christian or believer will say, yes, but God steps into the universe once in a while to stir up the particles to make bacterial flagellum or whatever God's busy making <laughs> uh, to, um, to give creation as something to do. <clears throat> Perform miracles. You know, I mean, Newton struggled with this. You know, it's like by his theory of gravity, things should wind down. The clockwork should wind down. A planet should spiral in. And so what's keeping it going? And, you know, maybe he started the whole thing off, you know, whew, gave it a good spin the galaxy or the solar system or something, but, but if it winds down, then he's got to step in once in a while to wind it back up. And So at some point, there should be some detectable 
entrance into the world from the supernatural world, whatever that is. Anyway, this has never been, this has never happened. This has never been detected. So, uh, so I go so far as to say there's no such thing as the supernatural or the paranormal, which is a whole different subject we deal with. These are just fuzzy words people use to talk about something we don't understand. There's just the normal, the natural, and all the stuff we don't can't understand yet. And the and the fate of the paranormal and the supernatural is that it, it quits getting used as a linguistic placeholder for a mystery when the mystery is solved. In exactly the same way as when cosmologists talk about dark energy and dark matter, they're just using those words to as a linguistic placeholder until we figure out what it is. So for cosmologists, astronomers, Dark energy and dark matter, that's just the start of the research program. Now let's go out and see if we can figure out what it is. For the believer, you know, God, instead of dark energy, is God. That's the end of the argument. They think that's an answer, but it's not the answer. There's, it doesn't supply any answer at all. Even if there is a God, you say, okay, God did it. Yeah, we still want to know how. You know, how did she do it? What, what forces? Did, thank you. Because <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started on <laughs> deities with with penises and well, I mean <laughs> sons. He had a son. What? <laughs> he killed himself to save me from himself. What? I mean, okay. <laughs> so logically, there can, there's okay. The most you could find if you employed the intelligent design research program in search of a being capable of creating DNA out of RNA, which they think happened, or the eye, or the wing, or any complex life, the Cambrian explosion, um, any, any one of the dozen or so places that intelligent design creationists think that the deity or the designer came in and did something. Like in 2001, the monolith, you know, the, the evolution happened all the way up to hominids, these little you know, Lucy-like creatures running around at the start of the film. And then poof, the aliens come, they put the monolith that gives a spark of humanity, and the next thing you know, spaceships are floating around. Um, uh, so, but, uh, so, so, but the best their argument would get them is that. Just some extraterrestrial intelligence, considerably more powerful than us, seeded the earth with life. That's all they could get. That's the, that's the most they could ever discover is just a super smart ET. And it doesn't even have to be that much more advanced than us because look what we're already capable of doing. You know, genetic engineering since Crick and Watson. Uh, you know, uh, stem cells, smartphones. Here's little smartphones. You have more computing power in your smartphone than the Apollo 11 astronauts had when they went to the moon. Right? I mean, that's pretty amazing. A Maasai warrior with a smartphone connected to the internet has more information access than President Clinton did 15 years ago already. And, 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 these, and, and this rate of change is accelerating. This is the singularity stuff. This, this stuff we can track. You can see it happening. You can see companies doing this. The Google goggles, have you read about the Google goggles? Right? You're going to have goggles, the internet's on the, on the glass. And you're walking down the street <laughs> surfing the net. And you say, I see you. It's like, I don't know who this guy is, and a little facial recognition software, boom, your Facebook page pops up, there you are, I know your name, I know where your, all your friends are, and it's like, boom, right there, standing in front of me, never seen you before. This is coming. They're going to introduce this within like a year, right? So how much more advanced would an extraterrestrial be if we did encounter them? Well, first of all, they're not going to be behind us because we won't encounter them. They have to be ahead of us because they come here or whatever. Um, and, and they're not going to be just like five years ahead of us technologically, <laughs> like Roswell. You know, oh, we back engineered silicon, you know, wafers and chips and computer parts from the aliens in 1947 landed in Roswell, where we were using vacuum tubes and now the transistor. We got the transistor from the aliens. This is actually a theory. It's like, but they were just like five years ahead of us, that's it? Somehow they managed to traverse the vast distances of interstellar space with technology five years better than us, that's it? And by the way, they're not gonna be bipedal primates with some gnarly stuff on their forehead and speaking English with a weird accent, okay? That's, Star Trek is limited by the budget of the wardrobe artists. They can only do so much with, Play tech, uh, you know. Anyway, 